morning we're going to be looking at uh, some interesting things, hopefully, as far as the plan of salvation is concerned. Just a few moments ago we read this verse here from Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 34. Here we have the story of the Philippian jailer and Paul and Silas and their conversion of him. I want you to really focus in on this question. It's been called the greatest question ever to be asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is an important question for all of us because of all that is at stake. What we are talking about is the salvation of our souls. What we're talking about is the eternal destination of our souls and how we answer this question. If we know the answer to this question and we obey that answer, then we can be found saved and we can be found in heaven in the by and by. If we know the answer to this question or don't know the answer to this question and don't obey it, then we can be lost in hell for an eternity. How we answer this question is very, very important. Here's how sometimes we perhaps answer this question. We answer it that uh, in order to be saved, you must be baptized. While definitely baptism is an important answer, that is not the entire answer. If we were asked the question, sir, what must I do to be saved? The answer would not be solely, you must be baptized. Although that's what many of our denominational friends think that we believe because we do place a lot of emphasis on it, let us be sure to know that that is not the sole thing that one must do in order to be saved. When we ask the question, what must I do to be saved? Sometimes we answer like this, well, you need to hear, you need to believe, you need to repent, you need to confess and be baptized. You know, those five steps, and then you'll be saved. While those five steps may be part of it, again, this is not solely all that must happen for one to be saved. Let us never be just those people that are five steppers, if you will. Definitely these things are all scriptural things, but that is not it. There is more to salvation than just hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and be baptized. In fact, when we talk about this great question and answering this great question, I want us to see that there are uh, uh, needs to be 11 things that are essential to salvation. We want to have balance in the idea of salvation. We don't place emphasis on what is important, but not too much emphasis that we forget about everything else. For instance, there is a uh, group of people in the religious world today that are very, very grace-focused. Now, while grace is an important part of salvation that we'll look at in just a moment, it is not the only part of salvation. Many times they just, they just pump grace, 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 and you would think that there's nothing you have to do to be saved. Now, all of us are saved because of the grace of God. However, that is not true. Sometimes we, perhaps, focus so much on baptism. And we say, you must be baptized, you must be baptized, you must be baptized, that we may forget about everything else. Definitely, that is not true either. We must have balance. And then there are 11 things, 11 things that are essential to our salvation. 11 things that must happen if we want to be a part of the saved for an eternity. Let's notice these 11 things quickly. First of all, you must have grace. Ephesians in chapter 2 and verse 8 says, For it is by, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Or Titus and in chapter 2 and in verse 11 says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. We must have grace. Also, we must have blood. Over in Hebrews and in chapter 9 and verse 22, it talks about how that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Or in 1 Peter and in chapter 1 and verses 18 and 19, you are not redeemed by corruptible things like silver and gold from the aimless conduct of your, the tradition of your fathers, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without spot, without blemish. We need grace, we need blood, but also we need the gospel. Over in Romans, in chapter 1 and in verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Or in 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, and in verses, uh, verse 2 and 3, he talks about how that this is the gospel which I have presented to you, which you have received, and in which you stand is the gospel by which you are saved. We are saved 
by the gospel. But also, we need to have faith. We need to believe. Over in Hebrews, in chapter 11 and in verse 6, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, we have this passage where uh, the writer says that without faith it is impossible to please him and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Or in 1 Peter in chapter 1 and verse 9 where it says, the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. We must have grace, we must have blood, we must have the gospel, we must have faith, but also we must have repentance. Over in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, there where Paul is addressing those Greeks there, he says that God once overlooked the ignorance of man, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Or perhaps as we think about over in 2 Corinthians and in chapter 7 and in verse 10, where it says that godly sorrow produces repentance which leads to salvation. We also need confession. Romans in chapter 10 and verse 10 says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Jesus says, If you confess me before men, I will confess you my Father in heaven. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. We must have grace. We must have blood. We must have the gospel. We must have faith, repentance, confession, and also we must have baptism. Mark in verse chapter 16 and verse 16 says that he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe will be condemned. Or 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 21 there is an antitype which also now saves us baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh but the answer uh, uh, but the appeal for a good conscience to God through the, fa- through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now a lot of times we stop there but we need even more than just that. Not only do we need baptism, but also we need obedience. Over in Hebrews in chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9, it says, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Being perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation, salvation again, to all who obey him. Or as it says over in James and in chapter 2 and in verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only or faith alone. Those works of obedience are needed. But past that, we also need something else that's great. We need love. Love's an important part of salvation. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, there Paul says that uh, and for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision or un- uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Or Paul, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 13, that great love chapter, and in verse 2, he says, Though I have all prophecy and understand all mysteries and have all faith, that I can even remove mountains, if I have not love, I am nothing. We must have love. And then also, we must have the church. Over in Ephesians in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, There Paul says that he has put all things under his feet and for him to become head over all things to the church, which is his body. Or Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, where Paul says that um, husbands should love, husband is the head of the wife, there's also as Christ is the head of the church, the Savior of the body. And then the 11th thing that we need is we need faithfulness. Over in Revelation chapter 2, we know the passage that says, Remain faithful unto death, and unto you be given the crown of life. Or perhaps as it's put in Matthew 24 and verse 13, But he who endures, endures to the end shall be saved. There's a lot of passages, there's a lot of things, but those 11 things are essential. Those 11 things are important. Those 11 things are the things we need and things we all need to focus on in order to have balance in the plan of salvation. Those 11 things puts us in motion to that eternal life we can have in Christ Jesus. But notice this also. Not only are those 11 things essential, but none are exclusive of any other. None are exclusive of any other. For instance, let's think about grace again. Grace is what makes salvation possible. If it was not for the grace of God, you would not be here this morning. 
If it was not for the grace of God, you would have no hope of salvation, no matter what. It is grace that starts the ball rolling. It is God giving us that, that unmerited favor. He is providing that gift, providing the way of salvation for us. There's nothing that we can do to earn salvation that we can say, I've done all these things, therefore I deserve it. You have to give it to me. Instead, it is a free gift from God that we must choose to accept. Grace is not exclusive of the rest. But also the same thing with blood. Blood of Christ is that which pays for our salvation. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 6 and in verse 20, there it says that you were bought at a price. In Acts 20 and verse 27, we find that Christ was the blood of Christ that purchased the church. We need that blood. Without the blood, there is no salvation. We even sing a song sometimes, Jesus paid it all. I owe it all to him. Sin left a crimson stain, but he has made it as white as snow. We need to realize that blood is so very important. But also, we have to realize that the gospel is important. Without the gospel, then the word cannot be presented. Without the gospel, we do not know about the grace. We do not know about the crucifixion. We do not know about the blood that was shed. The gospel makes known the facts, the commands, and the promises that have to do with salvation. It's the gospel that tells us the facts about Jesus Christ, about how that he was born, how that he lived the perfect life, how that he died on the cross, how that he was buried and rose again. It's the gospel that gives us the commands, the commands like we have to have faith. Faith is the understanding of the facts of the gospel that starts to change the mind. It tells us about repentance. Repentance is the change of mind that leads to a change of action. It is no longer doing what you want to do, but what God wants you to do. We talk about confession. Confession is that which makes it known to all men that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Confession is us saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Let's make known to all, but then we also have baptism. Baptism is that which changes the state from one person being unsaved to save, from being lost in sin to being made white again as snow, from someone being outside of Christ to be put in Christ. That's why Galatians in chapter 3, verses 26 and 27 says, For we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for many of us have been baptized into Christ, have Put on Christ. That is where we make that step to go into. We change our state. Faith starts to change the heart. Repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Confession makes it known to all. And then baptism is that which changes the state. But still, above that, we also need obedience. Obedience is what separates us from that living, saving faith to that dead faith. James in James chapter 2 and in verse 26 says, Just as a body without a spirit is dead, so is faith without works, or faith without obedience. In fact, in just a few moments, we're going to sing an invitation song. The invitation song is trust and obey, both faith and obedience. Obedience by itself, no. Faith by itself, no. But faith and obedience, working together, that's what produces this saving faith. But definitely also love. Love is part of that saving faith. Love is part of this plan of salvation. In fact, over in first, uh, 2 Corinthians, and in chapter 5, and in verse 14, it says the love of Christ compels us. The reason why we do anything, the reason why we are seeking salvation is not because we are afraid of hell. It's not because we just want the heaven. It's not because we want to please anybody here on earth. The reason why we are doing these things, hopefully, the underlying motive of all of it that leads to salvation is that Jesus Christ loved us and we love him. That is the key. Don't let ever your motivation for salvation or anything you do in Christianity be just because your spouse wants you to or just because your parents want you to or just because the elders or the preacher or the deacons or just because your great-grandma wants you to. The reason why you do things, what compels you, what motivates you is the love of Christ. That perfect love of Christ. That is definitely an essential part of salvation.